Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. What's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm here with my great friend, Anthony Trucks. Anthony, what is up, brother? How are you? Nothing much, but man, I'm golden. I am, I'm enjoying my day before my birthday when I get older. And, and I already knew that because my knees told me. <laughs> Happy almost birthday, man. Well, I appreciate you taking a little bit of that time and spending with me in the Unbroken Nation today. 
you and I have known each other a little bit over a year now, connecting almost a year and a half, really, if you think about it. We connected on social media a while ago, Meta Influencer. Really? Um, for those who don't know Anthony Trucks, what's the high level? What are you doing right now? Where are you at in the world? What's happening in your life? Oh, man, and I, am, uh, I am enjoying the beauty of the life that I've worked incredibly hard to earn, uh, which in the beauty by that, I mean, I get to have a marriage that that is solid, man. My wife and I get along real well. My kids have a solid present uh, parents in between my wife and I, and we got good relationship with the kids. Uh, business is good. So I'm not stressing off of making a whole bunch of money to keep my, you know, above water. Uh, I did all the things that people tell you to do, but most people don't do. And so that's kind of where I'm at. However, all that stuff, it allows me to say, I have this joy. And the real benefit is I get to actually find ways to give it back to people who need it right? I, I teach all the time, get a borrowed joy when you don't have it, but you got to get it from people who have it. So for me, man, I'm, I'm a well, I just keep pouring it out as best I can. And the coaching I do and the speaking I do in the world I get to live. in. so, I mean, that's kind of the high level. Uh, I'm a former NFL athlete, American Ninja Warrior on NBC. I happen wearing a shirt today. I didn't do it on purpose, but I'm rocking the shirt. Um, first former NFL athlete, I hit a buzzer on the show. I'm a speaker. I'm a coach. Um, I got a book coming out next year, man. I just, I show up yeah. the way that I believe uh, I was putting this planet to show up and I do it's it day in, day out with, with joy. It's a powerful testimony, man. I, you know, I think I, and we're going to tap into this and I know a little bit more about your story than probably most of this audience listening wasn't always this way, Anthony. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I constantly think about my journey too, you know, looking at where I am as a coach and speaker and author doing the things that we kind of parlay on and looking at the trajectory of my life, going back to running the streets, breaking into houses, being, you know, mm -hmm. around the foster care system and, and being in these really awful situations and scenarios. And then recognizing mm -hmm. at one point, like life is so much about what we make it. Mm -hmm. People would say statistically, People like you and I, we're built to fail. There is 0% chance that we should be successful. And yeah. yet here we are. And people often will go, oh, well, that's an anomaly. You guys are just, you know, the 1% of the people who have managed to figure it out. I don't know shit about shit, Anthony. I figured this out from really, really incredible, difficult, hard work, yeah. putting myself in uncomfortable situations and understanding that life isn't always fair. No, not supposed to All be. that said, take me back. Your, your story is just really incredible. Like I look at you and I go, Anthony trucks, this dude's like fucking walking movie, but like realistically I resonate because so much of it is about the effort that we put in yeah, and, man. and at the baseline, it took a lot for you to get here. Yeah. I mean, beyond the baseline, right in the actual game itself, damn it. It was a, uh, it's been a long journey. And I think the thing is, I love this statement. I'll preface it with this is that a smooth sea makes not a skilled sailor. There's an aspect to the world we live in, and, and there's always storms. The world right now is in a big storm of crazy, right? It's just how the world works. But a lot of people haven't been enough storms to figure out how to navigate it, so they're capsizing. And so it's not to me to say like, hey, hey, look at me. I'm telling you right now, I hate a lot of the stuff that happened as a kid. I didn't enjoy any of it, but I appreciate it now, right? There's appreciation. And appreciation is an enjoyment. It's just like, hey, I get it. So for me, it started when I was three years old. I was put into foster care by my mom, me and my three siblings, and went into a system. It's a, a paycheck system. So essentially, as long as you don't die, they can do whatever they want. And they get paid for yeah. it. So we have people that would beat us, starve us, torture us, put me in. I, I got put inside chicken coops as like a five-year-old and chased chickens to earn meals. And if I didn't catch it, I didn't eat that night. I'd be hoarding food. I would get up in the middle of the night, climb on the counter, open the pantry, find whatever I could eat. And I'd, whatever I couldn't finish, I would tuck behind the bed and they'd like pull the bed back and see just trash. They'd beat me. Well, yeah, because you didn't feed me. I'm still in food. I'm a little kid, you know, and. I don't know these people, but I'm in their home. It's just a really weird dynamic. And I'd be putting shopping carts and pushed down hills towards moving traffic. I was forced to lick the bottom of kids' shoes till my tongue bled. Like really heinous, torturous stuff. This is all before six years old. Mm -hmm. So developmental years of what I'm developing, like care, compassion, trust, I'm getting none of that. I'm getting the complete opposite. So that's why a lot of kids that are growing up in foster care situations, dude, 75% of the inmates in American prisons are former foster kids. Yeah, It's, it's, not, it's, it's not an it's, accident. We'll be right back to today's show, but first I need to ask you a question. Are you feeling stuck? Are you feeling like you don't have the support to go to the next level in your healing journey? Are you feeling like you wish you had a little bit more support from not only myself, but the Unbroken Nation? Well, my friend, I want to invite you to come and join our live weekly coaching sessions in Think Unbroken. All you have to do is go to keys, K-E-Y-S, keys.thinkunbroken.com to sign up and join us today with 100% money back, no questions asked, guaranteed and no contract or commitment 
every week for the next year. You can come and be a part of our live coaching sessions each Monday as we dive deep into not only answering your questions, but questions from the Unbroken Nation and help you take all of the information that you learn in the podcast, in the courses, and other areas of this journey, bring them into your life, and use it in a way that is practical, life-changing, and transformative. So my friend, join us at keys.thinkunbroken.com, and we will see you this Monday. No, it's a terrifying statistic. And, and yeah. so I was never in foster care, but I was in foster care homes all the time. Yeah. And in some of the violence, not only I experienced, but I saw, you know, other children experience, like yeah. it is profound. So right. yeah. let me ask you this, because I think this is really interesting. Were you cognizant that something was wrong? Uh, no, I mean, it's the thing. My first memories was the like, so you don't really know anything's off. You know what I mean? It's kind yeah. of a weird thing. It's what you normalize to. It sucks. It really, really sucks. But you get normalized at a crazy and that becomes reality. Now you do have the normalization of you don't like it. It's not like, oh, this is cool. I'm getting beat. No big deal. But it's like, it sucks. And it's, it's almost like it kills your soul because there's no, there's no relief. There's not like a bunch of good days. And all of a sudden you go to Disneyland and hang out. Like, no, this is every, this is your life, you know? And people yeah. get normalized to it. So that was my world. So for a lot of reasons, I was a really shut down, bad acting out and trouble in school little kid for a lot of years, man. I wasn't even... I wasn't allowed to go to kindergarten for more than 30 minutes at a time. Yeah. Kindergarten, dude. Kindergarten I get that, man. Two hours. I, I, I totally resonate with that. I was constantly the kid in trouble, picking fights, being suspended. Yeah. You know, I, in elementary school, I broke my hand on another kid's face. And that. like, you yeah. know, that, that's kind of the reality of what it was. Yeah. But, but something special happened for you, right? Yeah. I got a little yeah. bit of a different, I get dropped into a different dynamic. At six years old, I get put into a family, which is a unique, uh, a unique difference to me. So I become the only black kid in an all white family, very poor. So we had a weird dynamic because, because uh, like I didn't really fit in and I was in a non-diverse area at the time, but at the same time being poor, man, it didn't make it any easier. You know, like I was yeah. I'm just a little, poor little black kid <laughs> running around getting in trouble with, with like weird stuff in my hair and not taking showers. I was a stinky kid in class. For a lot of years, to like seventh grade, bro, I was the stinky kid in class. I just, bro, I was the bedwetter. I get it. I, I do the same it. thing, dude. I was wet in the bed till I was 14 before I got adopted. I had a weird, man, it's, it's, it's almost like a psychological, so my real mom the whole time from six to 14 is the more conscious times of my life. She would have visitation rights, but never show up to visitations. Mm. So what happens, I had three siblings. They had the same dad, same mom. I just had the same mom, right? Different dad. And so we go to visitations. He'd always be there. They're playing with their dad and hanging out. And I'm sitting here crying myself, you know, just on the, on the curb right there because my mom's not there. My dad's not there. I'm just hanging out. And I remember every night she'd call me and make up the craziest of excuses. Like, I'm not even kidding. She would tell me that she couldn't make it because she was working with NASA. She was a Mensa member. That she started Apple, had a hair salon she'd own. Like, I'm talking off the wall. Like, I'm certain, no lie, amazing things. And believe them to a T, dude. Mm. And then she'd always end like this. Every never failed. She'd say, "Hey, um, we got off the phone tonight. Pack a bag. Be at the window at eight o'clock. I'm gonna drive. I'm gonna pick you up, and I'm we're gonna get out of here." Man, now, as a kid, it's torture. Hell, torture, bro. Because as a kid, all you want to do is go home. So she was attaching herself to me on purpose. And every night, I'd sit there and watch the cars go by. I'd cry myself to sleep. Wake up to a wet bed, not from tears, and I couldn't stop it, man could not stop it and it happened for so many years that at 14 i was done with it i'm like i'm done with this man i can't can't do this and i remember went to a court out here in martinez and sort of in front of a judge i remember going into the judge's chambers him giving me a feel for what's going to take place i'm a little a 14 year old kid you know and he tells me what's going to go down and i say okay and so he walks me out and i stand in the, the little you know what are they, the the jurors box not the juror box whatever that one is the uh what do they do the uh, the whole witness box sure i have no idea box there you go and uh, they, yes, you know, do you want to be, you know, this woman's son? And he says, I need you to make the statement. I look her in her eyes and I say, I no longer want you to be my mom anymore. Yeah. And it severed parental rights. And for the first time I could be adopted And this family that had been there the whole time. And granted, we weren't great. I'm talking dysfunction, like crazy. Mm -hmm. When I say poor, bro, I'm not talking about like, we didn't have much. I'm talking about like poor, like rats in the pantry, cockroaches in the garage. I had to, I, we got shirts. We, we were the people, you know, you donate to Goodwill. When don't we're the ones that Goodwill donated to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we, I, we had these dude, right there, we had these right bags there. of clothes that had nasty shirts that weren't washed. That's what I would throw on for school. Yeah. And so that was my world, dude. I just, but I was adopted. 
I finally had a home, you know, like that was the, the beginning. And so that was the start of a better life, not, not a straight uphill, you know, climb, but like it, it was a catalyst to better. Yeah. I, and you know what? And, and sometimes someone's worse is our better. And yeah. I, I resonate with that. And, you know, I had this moment. It's so amazing how much stuff we have in common. I had this moment when I was 16, when I put a restraining order on my mother, mm. I, I saw what the future looked like. Yeah. I saw, okay, if I do not remove this person and set what now I have the words personal boundaries, then I was just like, I need to create some sort of safety in my life. Everything was different, yeah. but there was so, like, if anything, though, that's when the uphill battle climb be like really began because like yeah. being biracial, being raised by a racist white grandmother in an all black neighborhood really kind of screws you up. And bit. so I like you, like I latched onto sports. I wrestled. I played football. I was just seeking something. Yeah. What What was that like for you? Because I'm really curious and, and, and the impact that it has now had on your adult life. What was it like for you to sit there and make that testimony at 14 years old and do something so incredibly difficult and uncomfortable that I, I would say, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but probably changed the trajectory of your entire life. Yeah. I mean, it didn't just change it because of the ability to have some strength to do it i mean you gotta realize at the time i'm 14 and i just i just don't want to deal with her crazy anymore it wasn't like i was making a stand for a better life uh and it showed because now what i got to do for the first time that most people don't think is amazing and special but i got to play football so when it up happening was now i get to go on and i get to go do this thing that i loved doing out at recess out at practice so like it was gonna be an amazing fun thing and i got out there to do it and i sucked man i was horrible you know like i was i was not good at by any stretch of the means and, and I was met with the fact that like, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out this thing that was supposed to be great. It wasn't, I got let down again and I shut down to be totally honest. Like I shut down and it was like my freshman year after two years of being pretty horrible at the sport that things turned around. And here's the crazy thing, like sports I needed, I needed to have that. Cause on one end, I'm the black kid who's never been around black kids in high school now. I mean, I talk like this, which isn't like most of the guys and girls talk when I was, you know, 15 years old in high school in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, like, hey, how you doing? What do you mean, how you doing? What you mean, how you doing? Because well, we don't talk like that out here. You know, Oreo, I got called an Oreo every day. And then I didn't fit with the rest of the people because I just wasn't, I didn't look like them. So I was like, man, I, sports is where it's got to be. But I was horrible. And I made this choice to check out, dude. I was like, I'm checked out. Uh, quite literally, like I was done with football. I was didn't doing school anymore. And in my family, my mom never graduated from high school. I think my dad did, but he was 12 years older than me. I was adopted. So she, they were super young. And on top of that, like my siblings, we didn't, no one took care of our school. No one was checking our grades. Nobody mm -hmm. cared. My mom didn't care. I'm the only one of all my six siblings in that foster family to have graduated from the actual high school, not continuation or GED, like, let alone go to college like I did. So like, I'm not supposed to do well. And I was checking out and this girl says some statement that was a really unique gift that I wish people could all get. And I got this gift. And what she said was to somebody else, not even talking to me, he goes, well, the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And it was a really weird statement because what it meant was she was making this pretty much a, a, a statement that was gonna lock her into place and say, this is who I am because of this thing that she had no control over. And I was like, damn, I don't want that to be me, man. Like, I don't, uh, and I remember 15 years old, dude, it settled into my soul. And I remember that whole day was a weird, like, and I went home. I remember at one point I was at home and I was like, I'm done. I'm, I'm not, it's going to be me. And I stood up in front of a mirror in my bedroom. And I used to brush my hair. I used to have waves back then. And I stood up in front of the mirror and I said, you're going to be great. And it wasn't this like, hey, you, you're going to be great, bro. Like it was dead in my pupils, like six inches from my face. You're going to be great, aunt. And it was this different kind of connection that I like, you get that nod of your head to yourself. Like I'm crazy right now. I'm hella crazy, but it's going to happen. And so it switched, dude. And next thing I know, man, I did everything a great football player does, even though I got made fun of because I sucked trucks, man. Why are you catching the football? You're weak, bro. Why you have to lift and weights? You're weak, bro. Like you ain't fast all that all day long. I kept working. And Hey man, what you, you, you ain't gonna be nothing. I, you ain't got no spot next year. I kept working. Dude, the next year I showed up, I was catching 500 footballs a day. So I never got to football. I was out there lifting every weight I could to be stronger. I would run routes. I would be out of the parks by myself, dude, by myself with a family that doesn't look like they're not athletes. They're heavy set. I'm the only athlete in the family. There's no one driving me, but me. And here's the unique thing. It's great about that. I believe that what you do in the dark allows you to shine the light. And so I came back the next year, like, bro, I was an animal, bro. I was 
it was a different kind of um, drive. It was like when the ball's in the air, that is my football. You don't have the right to take it from me. When you're running at me, you are mine. You're going to the ground. You don't get the opportunity. You don't have the right to run past me. Like it was a different sense. Like you don't get to tackle me. I'm putting your face into the ground. How dare you? Do you know what I did the last year? The, the way that I showed up wasn't just a skillful athlete. I was, I was deeply determined to make sure I stayed in line with who I had created myself to be. Yeah. I, Anthony, I love that, man. I, I think that's so powerful. I, I similarly had a moment later into my twenties where I had what I called the mirror moment where I looked in the mirror and I said, from this moment, everything changes. Yeah. And that was a measure against where my life was. There was so much chaos that was happening around me and recognizing like I was not showing up. I was leveraging the trauma, the abuse, all the bad shit I'd been through being called Oreo, wetting the bed, you know, all of those yeah. things. And I was saying, I guess this is who I am using it as an excuse to, to adapt that kind of mindset, whether you're 25 or 15 or 75, like there is, there is something about that moment in which you come to terms with your future in which you are actually making a choice and a decision that requires so much, not only vulnerability, but inner strength that it can forever change you. And I, I constantly push my clients into this place of, are you going to do what it takes to show up for yourself? Definitely. What are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? And, and in that moment, you recognize that the potential for everything that happened lied with you, right? And I think about this. I live my life by one simple phrase, no excuses, just results. And it just drives me forward, forward, forward. But at 15 years old, man, that's such an, a tremendous attitude to have about life in general and looking at the circumstance in which you come from. Talk to me about how does that continue to propel you? Because I think it's really easy to get motivated for one day, one yeah. week, one month, hit mm -hmm. the track, you're going, you're catching balls, and then ball 9,400,000 comes. How do you keep going? Like, how do you stay the course? It's who you are. It's got to be, it quite literally has to be a sense of it's who you are. And if you don't do this thing, you feel out of alignment. You feel gross. Like if you think yeah. about this, and I'll give you a synopsis of what the transition over the last, let's say 20 years, <laughs> it's crazy, 20 years has turned into, but here's how it boils down. If you think about a woman named, I don't know, Carrie, Carrie is a woman who doesn't work out and she kind of just, you know, wants to be in shape, never does. When she posts on social media, it's about her, her trip and a picture of the, the mountains and the ocean, never of herself. <laughs> it's uh, you know, a picture of her kids and there's food she's eating. That's all she posts. And it's very sparing. But then after a while, all of a sudden you start seeing Carrie post pictures of like a salad. And then you see Carrie post pictures of like a workout video she's doing. And then she posts her coach that's, you know, she's got coaching her, thanking her coach. And then that fateful day comes and she posts a video of herself. Progress book. Before, a little bit after. And then next thing you start seeing more of her in yoga pants and her workouts. And then she's now motivating people. And she's got people that are getting in better shape. And she's showing her videos of her, her slushies and her, her smoothies and all of her drinks and all this stuff. And now she's got clients, right? What nobody noticed along that journey, it wasn't just a journey of her to the point where like, She's posting things at the back end that would have scared the crap out of her when she was posting of just her kids. But now she posts these things because it's who she is and it's easy and it's fun and it's joyous. The transition took place over time, but for a lot of us, we don't realize that we're all Carrie. We all have something that we, we, we want to do, but we're, we're not in that space. It's not who we are yet. We haven't leaned in. We do what the bare minimum is. That thing we should be doing is scary and hard to us. But what Carrie did is she went in and spent the time over time building this person by actions in the dark so that when it came to the light on social, she's posting it now. It's not just a thing where she gets up and she's like, Oh, I got to work out five days a week. Oh, I got to eat salads. Oh, I got to coach my clients. It lights her ass up. Like she loves it. It's a joy to it all. That's how it goes for the next nine years, 20 years, 9,000 pitches. Cause you're not just doing it because you're trying to be that person. When you are that person, it's your new normal. When yeah. it's your new normal, it's effortless. And when you can yeah. get to the level of having effortless effort towards the thing that moves the needle for you, bro, your future is written in, in beauty. But it's a matter yeah, of getting to that point. I constantly think about this idea of creating myself. I leverage that. In the very same way you went to that mirror and you said, I am creating this ant. This is the person that I'm going to be. And you leverage that idea and stepped into it. Where was fear? What kind of role did fear play in your life? Because look, I get it. Like mm -hmm. the nicknames, the kids picking on you, the being yeah. bullied, even when you're in there trying the fucking hardest, there's always somebody to shit on you. 
How do, how do you combat the fear of the person that you were? And, and not only then, but even now, how do you combat the fear of this shadow self always wanting to be like, Anthony, you're not good enough. And transferring that into like, I'm going to do this anyway. What is that like for you? The conversation doesn't get had that much anymore. Before, it's a natural one. And it, I, I believe that as you get higher on the totem pole, there's always got to be a fear falling off. It's just a natural part of it. Uh, the way that I look at it is this, is, is, there's this cool TV show I used to watch years ago called American Gladiator. Remember that show at all? Yep. hundred yeah, percent. Love that show. Laser, and, and blazer, I, taser. <laughs> I, I know, yeah. One of the guys on there, Dan Nitro, I know Nitro is a good dude, man. I mean, him chat every once in a while. Um, Nitro, Dan Nitro, whatever. I can't think of, he just, he was Nitro. Anyway, so there's a cool part at the very end when they have to race up that whole mountain to get to the top, hit the buzzer. And this is where I look at fear. There's usually a fear of something chasing us. It's uh, the fear of a failure chasing us. It's the fear of somebody outing us for something we did in the past, right? It's a fear of failing. And what happens is it's, think of it this way. When you're the guy in front, boom, buzzer goes off. You take off, you're sprinting up that mountain. You're climbing. And then second buzzer goes off, boom, nitro's chasing you, right? Well, what happens is you're climbing that mountain and you can have a good tick. But here's what takes place for a lot of people. If you watch, I'm genuinely, watch the show. Here's what takes place. They're climbing. And as they're climbing, they do this thing where they stop and look down. And here's what's crazy. The gladiator, the fear, they're looking up at you and climbing. No, no, no stopping. No hiccup. They're just moving, right? When you take a second to look down at it, you stop your pace. You give it an opportunity to catch up to you. And they would get that ankle, yank them off. The ones who won, they almost never looked down. Almost ever. I watched a couple of times and I was thinking, I want to go back and look at some things. Like, did it happen? They're climbing and they just kept going. They can hear them. They just kept going. I'm talking the glider just almost gets the ankle and taps to just keep going. Boom, hit the buzzer. And it wasn't anything more than they just didn't stop and look. Because if any of them would have stopped for a second and looked, they're pulled off. So when you ask, like, how do I navigate the fear? I've realized it's always there. I can sense it. I feel it at my heels. But I don't ever take moments to stop and look down at it because it grabs me. So if people are living like, how do I live my life in a progressive state, man, stop looking back at it. If it gets you, hey, it got you. Cool. Go do it again. But don't give it the opportunity by slowing down and looking at it. Yeah, it's, it's powerful. It's powerful. It's so true. It's so true because we get to choose how we live our life. And if you're constantly seeking fear, I, I look at it as looking for an excuse. There's always a reason for you not to be successful. But yeah. I, I want to keep tapping in your story because I think we're getting to this place. It's really, really important. Mm -hmm. So. You're moving forward next year, high school football, crushing it. You're the Killing dude. It. Yeah. What next? What's going what, on? Well, now I'm trying to figure out how to become like the guy that I got moved from, you know, sophomore year. And so freshman year, I suck. Sophomore year, I'm supposed to suck too. But sophomore year, I'm balling. So I get moved to varsity. And I'm not very good at varsity. They put me at cornerback and I'm slow. Like, I'm not a cornerback, bro. Well, at that age, I was slow. And, uh, and so I'm trying to figure out this whole world of, you know, sports. But at the same time, I got a mom who's getting more sick. Uh, I got a brother who's off in the military. So it's kind of like just me at the house. Like I was close to him and the rest of the siblings I kind of was, but just, you know, it's the older brother, man. He was like my dude. At the same time, trying to navigate the whole girl situation, There's girls that like you now and you're, you know, dude, it's a tornado. I don't know who I am. In fact, at that age, if you go to Eric Erickson's psychosocial, you know, structures, it breaks down to where at that moment I'm having what's called role versus identity confusion. Sorry, identity versus role confusion. Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? We'll be right back to today's episode, but I want to take a moment and invite you to Think Unbroken Conference. That's right. Our next conference is happening right around the corner this December with amazing speakers from around the world who are leaders in personal development, trauma education, mindset, and more. All you have to do to register to watch for free, that's right, $0, come and join us, is go to myunbrokenlife.com, register and sign up. You can get access to the free event. Watch it live with us this December. It'll be myself speaking along with amazing human beings like Anthony Trucks, Jamie Bronstein, Leslie Logan, and a special interview that I'm doing with Dr. Gabor Mate that has never before been released. So come and join us, myunbrokenlife.com. All you have to do is put in your email. We'll send you over the registration. You'll be able to come and join us, watch live. And then if you want access to the recordings or more information there for you to keep them forever. But in the meantime, go sign up up, block it off on your calendar. This is going to be a transformational experience that you do not want to miss. Head over to myunbrokenlife.com to register for free. Until next time, be unbroken. So identity is like, I, usually you enter into life with having who you are anchored 
And then you have a role confusion. Who am I in the real world, in my career, in my you know, education? Who am I in my job, right? Now, most people have a good sense of who they are. Their mom and dad raised them right. They got a base of confidence and stability and honor and integrity to know who they are. Well, most people have that. I didn't. I didn't know who the hell I was. Like, I'm trying to figure out this world. My mom is sick, so my dad's taking care of her. I got no, nobody really watching what I'm doing, bro. I could come in and go whenever I wanted. I didn't really, I mean, what am I, I did, uh, the most I had was a, a job as a janitor. I was like, had to keep me structured. I could run around with whatever girls I wanted. I had a job that gave me enough money to get a little car. I'm driving a car around, but I could have gotten so much trouble. In fact, I did. At 17 years old, I got arrested for breaking into cars with some, doing some dumb stuff with some kids I didn't belong out doing, right? So what it ended up being was a situation where, man, I had to like navigate this, this new weird world find out who the hell I was because the world was coming at me fast. And, and in football, the greatest part was when I got better, when you get better at something that you sucked at, it's like this thing of when you first try something, it's a 10 of pain. You don't want to try it again because you don't want to be exposed to the pain of it. So you don't do it. You walk away, you make an excuse, you try something else. The next thing's a 10 of pain too. Shiny object syndrome happens. But here's what you should do. What I did, what everybody should do and that anybody who's been successful has done, they try it again. They learned something the first time, they apply it again. Doesn't mean it's going to be a zero, it's going to be a nine. Nine still hurts, man. Like nine is very uncomfortable. So I tried again, it's an eight, then a seven, then a six. And eventually, if you stay long enough and you keep getting back up, it goes to zero, but it's not zero. It's joy. This thing you hated doing, you love. You can't wait to do more of it, right? And so what happens is for me, when I got that journey of 10, nine, eight, and I, got to, I had joy out there balling, I anchored myself to something that gave me more than anything else other things could give me. So when I'm trying to find out who am I as I enter this whole new world of a role confusion, I'm the football player. I had that one thing that honestly saved me because had I entered that next level of life without being the football player, I literally had nothing else. Yeah. And that's how you see people end up as statistics. So football saved me, dude, just out of sheer aspect of being present in that thing and giving me a sense of self. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, sometimes you get lucky with that. Right. And there's, there's resiliency aspects that play in the role and probably having a coach who at least, or at least one other person in your life who was mm-hmm. spurring you on and challenging you and saying, Anthony, you can do this. I, you know, here's one of the things I think is, is really interesting. We don't do this on our own. No. Right. And I think about that. Who were who was playing the role of resilient leader and and coach in your life at that time when when you're for lack of a better term lost? Uh, I had some football coaches. My mom and dad, man, they they meant well, but they weren't like driving me to be that. In fact, when I was looking at colleges, now granted, at, when I started getting scholarship offers, I'm getting looked at by the entire Pac-10 at the time. You know, everything from USC to Michigan um, to Nebraska. You know, all these are not obviously Pac-10, but different schools also outside of Pac-10. Um, Utah's, Hawaii's, all these different schools. I'm like, hey, mom, dad, what should I do? Uh, whatever, pick one. Wait, what? Do you know what this, you know what's going on right now, right? I'm one of like a few percentage of human beings that are going to get an opportunity to play for free at the college, you get a free education for playing a game. You want to help out? No, we trust you. Choose your thing. That's what it was, dude. And I'm like, nobody cared. No one was paying attention. I was just out there rocking and rolling, figuring my whole life out. And uh, and sure enough, man, I had some coaches in, in high school that were really good about seeing who I was as a human and helping guide me. So as coach George was one of my good coaches back in the day, um, who was, he was good at, at understanding like what I needed to do to base perform at high school level. Great heart, great guy. I don't think he understood the football like game at the college level. Cause it's just, it's intricate, man. It's far more intricate than it should be. <laughs> and, and just in, in hindsight, but I say should be, I'm, I'm dead wrong. Like it's crazy. Just when you go to that level from high school to college, and you didn't play at a big school, like in high school, bro, it's, it's a leap of mentality. Like, what in the world am I learning right now? Then you get it and you can't get rid of it. Now I understand systems. Um, and then I had a guy, uh, man, one of, one of the good guys, uh, Chris Matthews. He's like a receiver coach. He only coached me my freshman and sophomore year. But like, he's like the consummate coach for me. He's like, when I think of high school, he was my coach. And a guy named Coach Anthony was a good guy, but he was never a position coach. But Coach Matthews, man, he was a dude that just loved on you. Like he yelled at you and you get your stuff done, but he loved on you, man. He was there. He supported you. He wanted to see you do well. And those guys, they were really good at kind of keeping me kind of dialed in. Like I wasn't a trouble kid. Like I wasn't out there causing problems. If anything, I had a weird ego. Cause when you get good at something and you're like the guy on campus, you get a little chip. I'm like, I had a little chip. I wasn't ever mean though. I was never mean to people, but I knew, I knew I was good, you know, and I had that kind of air to me. 
But I mean, I got voted homecoming king and I always did things to be nice to kids. I befriended a lot of cats that were like nerds. I got messages like three years ago, I got a message. I didn't even know, I can't recall this, but some girl's like, hey, I, I, you're not going to remember this, but whenever you were a senior in high school, I was a freshman and some sophomore boys were picking on me and like they were being really rude and nasty and, and you stopped it and you made them walk away and, and, and you made me feel safe. And I want to say thank you. I, I don't I don't remember any of I literally can't recall a single second of it or where it took place or what but like I was still a good guy and I like maybe remember like I was a good dude but I still had an air to myself but those guys they kept me doing what I needed to do they cooked me kept me getting the grades done because I was a good athlete but I had bad grades like it, it was one year where if I, I was like straight ass dude and if I didn't figure that the, the grades out I wasn't going to college I only got man I only had like a I think I graduated with like a two, two, five out of high school, two, five, two, six. Like I, barely. I, get that. I, I graduated with a 1.6. So oh, I am man. right there with you and not on time either. So let's be clear. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I was asking you a lot about this as baseline, right? Because I think it's okay. really important. We, we often come from these places when we survived intense traumas. I mean, Anthony, my friend, you've been through some shit. I've been through some shit. People listening to this, they've had a real hard life. Yeah, but, but there's something about these moments in which we make choices and decisions that forever change the trajectory of what's going to happen. Sure. You find yourself in this really powerful place of not only playing college football, but then leading into other things, right? And, and really stepping into life on your terms mm -hmm. as an adult. And because I, I want to be conscious of time, I, I could go way deeper with you, but I think this is really important. In this place you are now, looking at life and yeah. being in the position that you are in now as who I would consider a leader, this person who is stepping up and showing that like me, just because you come from this place does not mean that that is the life that you have to have. How does that impact you for who you are now? And, and more so, what led you down this path? Because it's really easy to take the fame and success that you've had to leverage that, go build a house on some island somewhere, disappear forever, right? But you've decided to step into doing something powerful and that's helping people. Yeah. Why? I mean, I think there's, there's part of it is let's not, let's not miss out on the fact that I, I have a selfishness to me, even to this day that I, I like the thank yous. And there's a, it's the one thing that I let be part of my past that I think serves the world. So when I grew up and I was, you know, put in the world, I didn't matter to anybody, not even my own mom, not the people that didn't take care of me. And then obviously along the long lines, people have obviously come to, to care for me, but I think it's because of the way I show up for them. But, but what I've realized in my life is I love thank yous, man. I selfishly enjoy the aspect of having someone say, thank you, you helped me a lot. It, it matters to me. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna sit here and be like, I do it because I just I care. Like, and it doesn't matter. No, I I love the thank yous. But here's the truth: the only way I get the thank yous that matter to me is by serving somebody at such a high level past what is logical to them. It, it, it's like I want people to go back and be like, holy crap, why would this person do that for me? I don't even right. Thank you, Aunt. So if I'm gonna get the thing I want, it only happens because I've given the thing you need. And that's how I live this life. And what I realized is all the things that have happened in my life, I had a lot of reasons to be a very angry human. I mean, it's yeah. no one, if I became a criminal right now, well, maybe not right now, if I became a criminal and I was doing crazy, I was, you know, out there going crazy, just being a mean dude, who's going to argue with me when I tell them my story? I mean, no one, they're going to be like, it makes sense. They'll probably tell you like, you don't have to be this. You can be something more. I'll be like, F you, you don't know me. They don't, I mean, that could easily be the statement. And, and I chose not to, because I realized that I will have to, and all of us, whatever you put into the world, you have to experience the emotion of as well. When you do bad things, if you're doing it to somebody else, you're in that emotional realm. It may not have happened to you, but there's this darkness that comes with that world. And I don't like that, man. I don't like the negativity. I don't like the feeling of that. And I want my thank you. So I realized I got to take all this stuff that happened and make something happen amazing from it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the, the old, the, the back of the apple that had like a, it's a pin cushion. Well, I think it was an apple mm -hmm. or something like whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. You could take needles and poke the needles into it and it holds the needles. Right. And I realized that for me, life is like a bunch of these little needles poked into it, dude. Like everything from mom giving me away. And then, you know, the different things in the foster homes. And then my, my wife at one point having an affair and then, um, you know, stuff with my real dad and like, you know, sports and injuries and family, all this craziness that happens. It's all these weird needles. that just pain. Right. And I can easily take a needle out and poke your eyeball with it because, you know, I want to ah, revenge, be that dude. Mm -hmm. But at one point, I made a conscious choice and said, you know what, with this very same needle, I can thread it 
and weave an amazing tapestry. And if I do that, again, I get to experience all the feeling of what's going out. So if I'm giving good, I get that good thank you. So when I started looking at my life, like I, I had a lot of reasons to be a mean dude and angry. But at this point in my life, the reason I go and help people is because, man, I'm making a great, amazing blanket to warm the world the best I can. I'm getting the feeling of appreciation to what I give to the world. And as much as I, I love the aspect of, you know, I do it just for everybody else, like I don't. And I do at the exact same time. I know what I'm doing. I'm conscious of it. And so I pour out, dude, we're talking today. I've been ripping since 6.30 in the morning and I'm gonna be not done till like 6.30 at night and I'm full. And none of it, none of it just, you know, none of it's business stuff. It's all talking to people. It's coaching clients that are like having some problems going on that aren't even paying for the time. Podcasts to serve people, talking to at-risk youth, helping people to organizations that have nothing to do with my business, nothing. It's a full day, 12 hours of serving people. And not so I can go publicly and say I'm serving people, but it's just to do it. And that fills me back up, man. Like I don't get dead tired. Like I, I love it. And it's a thing for me where the reality is not everybody is blessed with the problems I got. Yeah. Which you know, it, get the experience. It, it's so true. I, I so often go and acknowledge the trauma that I had. Mm -hmm. I go and acknowledge the fact that I went through hell and back and I look at my life now and I think about this in a, in a really, really impactful way, pretty constantly. And it's that, that my life is amazing, man. Like Anthony, I love my life. And in a way that most people could probably never understand, though I hope that they can, yeah. because I've been from the bottom. I've been where I slept on a concrete floor and had rats bite me in the night because we didn't have yeah. beds. And mm -hmm. I've been homeless and I've been living in cars and I've done all those things. Yeah. But yet, here's the thing, Anthony. I didn't want to let any of that define my life. And yeah. there's somebody listening right now, Anthony, who like us has come from this background and the yeah. fear is keeping them stuck. It is keeping them trapped. There is something inside of them that is leveraging and holding on to this idea that my life should be this way because of what happened to me and they cannot let it go. Yeah. They, how they, do you uh, do that? Like, Anthony, how do I let go of yeah. all of that shit? To live a life on my terms. You don't let it go, man. You get strong enough to carry it along with the rest. I, I don't know if you let it go. I don't, I mean, I, I have a forgiveness and I have a lightness to me, but I don't think the lightness comes because all of a sudden it's gone. It doesn't disappear, I don't think. I, if you think about if I have a, you know, a, a 50 pound bag, right? Two ways to make this, this bag you know, feel light. One, I just get rid of the bag, which good luck with that. This stuff is part of your life. Or you get strong enough until 50 pounds feels like five. And now you can carry it a little bit differently. Now it's, it's a benefit because I can take this thing as far as I need to. And it's not going to weigh me down. I think it's part of it is to understand that like, it doesn't 100% disappear. But at the same time, you get to choose what the outcome of this stuff is, man. If you've got this, this weight and it's, it's driving you insane, and it's going crazy, like it doesn't mean you have to go give it back to the world, man. You can let it go and move on and build something oh, vastly bigger and better than what you have. I think there's this, this perspective that people have in life of like, because this happened to me, this has to be the outcome. This has to be this thing. And what they are unfortunately doing is they are stating with their words a story that they then have to make right. So the problem with that is when I say, well, I I'm, an, I'm bad because I was in foster care. Cool. What do you have to do to make that story right? You got to be bad now. It's a problem. Or, you know, I'm broke because this took place. Or, you know, all men suck because this guy cheated on me and, you know, he did whatever. Cool. All right. So we're speaking that out loud. Or I'm unlovable because, you know, this has happened to me. Great. So if you speak it out loud, you don't want to lie to yourself. We don't. We don't like lying to ourselves. We stay in alignment. We will live our lives in a way to make that statement right. It shows up, and it's going to be a weird example, but it, it'll make sense. When people say, man, all white cops are bad. Well, then what happens is that guy gets around a white cop. What does he do? He eggs him on so that he can be right and say, see, look, white cop, he's bad. I'm right. And then all of a sudden these things spin off and it becomes this weird trajectory for the entire world. And it's like, dude, all we're doing is saying, because this took place, this is who I am. And we're living in a way to make it right. If you don't want that, change the story. Like yeah. genuinely tell yourself something different and live in a way to make that right. Is it yeah. easy? Hell no, it's not easy, but it's the way you got to do it. Yeah, it's, it's so incredibly difficult, Anthony. And, and I'm sure 
and and I'm so curious, you you must have struggled with self love and identity issues, right? I mean, oh. I, I know I certainly did and, and learning to cultivate vulnerability with myself enough to be like, I'm okay with loving myself is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done. And like you, I would seek how do I get this acknowledgement from from my mother, from my stepfather, from my family, from strangers on the street, someone, anyone, please know that I'm alive. Mm-hmm. And, and recognizing like, you actually have to fill that cup for yourself first. You and do. if other people want to love you, fuck, that's an amazing bonus, mm-hmm. but it has to start with you. And there are people listening right now who even through all the episodes and all the content and everything that exists in the world, this idea of self-love is probably the hardest battle that they face. What was your journey in like stepping into self-love? Man, my journey for self-love was a long one because <laughs> You have no reason to uh, to believe you should be loved when no one's give you a reason to believe you should be loved. It's a concept of like I should I should have love, but man, my journey was I had to earn it. That that's really what, I think the thing with with that is you have to get to the point where you believe you deserve it, and you don't believe you deserve it if you have nothing to show for it. You have no mm-hmm. point. So there's a statement I can't remember who told him, but they said you have to teach other people how to love you by how you love you. That's that's that was a very poignant statement that I heard. I can't remember who said it. But I loved it because it was this thing where like, yeah, if you you don't treat yourself right, no one's going to treat you right. So why, you know, then you'll think that you're unlovable. So you start with you, man. You love you by getting healthy. So you love the skin you're in. You love you by how you talk to yourself. You love you by how you go for that job and get that raise and make that money and have that car and that house. You love you, man. Then people hold you at a certain level and they'll give you love. It may not be all the love you want. It may be a different kind of love. Like they'll only love you because you're famous, right? That's possible. But the same capacity, if I have a relationship I want to get into, if I love me the way that I love me by how I talk to myself, how I hold myself, what, what I will accept, you won't let somebody love you any less, especially yeah. if they're an intimate partner, right? There's other ways. And so my self-love came from giving it to myself, but you give it to yourself by working past the points when you don't want to work. It happens in the weight room. It happens in the job. It happens in the reading of the book. It happens in all these areas. It happens when the moment hits that you're like, I can't go anymore. I don't want to. And then you do. And then you get a W. You go, holy crap. Oh, you're dope. I love you. Oh, that's cool. And then you start lo- and a little more, a little more. I mean, it's, even if it's like, hey, I'm just not going to eat sugar today. Okay. You get through the day, you don't eat sugar. Hey, great job, man. You didn't eat sugar today. Second day. Oh, great job. After a good week, you're like, hell yeah. I like this guy. He's able to fight through these things. He's doing good. And then if you like something, you respect it. You respect it. You can love it. Yes. And that's the role. I think self-love for me, it's, it's actions. I love the statement of action ends suffering. If you're mm-hmm. suffering and have a lack of love, only an action is going to put that back in. Yeah, hundred percent. And pushing yourself into places that you didn't know that you could go. Because let me tell you this, and, and I'm sure you resonate. There is that moment of victory when you look back down the mountain and you go, "Laser, you didn't get me, bro. I did it right." And you recognize how important it was to push yourself through something so incredibly difficult that you're willing to say, I'm going to die to make this thing happen. I'm willing, I'm willing to die to love myself. Right. Mm -hmm. My final question for you here, Anthony, before we wrap up is where can everybody find you? Um, I am in the ethers of the world. I am all around you. No, I'm just kidding. I, uh, the best place to find me is be on Instagram at Anthony trucks, or, uh, if anybody wants to text me, just go to textanthony.com And then you can, uh, you can, it'll literally pull up the chat uh, of a text mess on your phone, like your iMessage and send me a message. Brilliant. Yeah. You know, Anthony, I, I could literally sit here and, and talk with you all day. We're, we're, we're only at the surface level of how deep this really goes, but mm-hmm. I, I think that your journey is incredible and it's such a testament to this idea that if you make a decision and you put in the hard work, you can have the life that you want to have, yeah. but you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to do? And, and Anthony, you're willing to step in and show up and that's powerful. And I see you for that, my friend. My final question for you is yeah, what does yeah. it mean to you to be unbroken? Unbroken. Um, I think that when I hear that, I'm thinking like to not be, not be able to be broken is one thing, but unbroken uh, would mean that I got broken and I got put back together. It's the, the antithesis or something like that, right? Is it antithesis? I don't know what the word is. And antithesis. Antithesis. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew that the word existed in a way that I was supposed to use it, but it's the opposite of that is the way I see it. So how I hear that is it's not that you weren't broken because we all have errors. We break, man. It, it happens. You know, no, nobody's stretch Armstrong in here. We can get stretched to the point. Of, even stretch Armstrong could break, man. Yeah. But you stretch and you break. But the thing is to say, I'm not going to stay broken. 
think that's kind of the opposite. Un is the opposition of broken. So for me, it means, man, uh, letting things break, but putting them back together. What are those Japanese pots that they, there's some Japanese pot that if you break it, you put it back together at the seams of the cracks with gold. And it makes this beautiful, you know, thing that's like, I would put it on my mantelpiece. It's beautiful. It's broken, but the, it's lined with gold, right? And I think there's that, that perspective for me of like, the most beautiful things are the ones that have been broken and put back together. And the people that I know, the businesses that I've been part of, the, even that pot, man, there, there's a beauty to the brokenness of humanity because I think it gives that individual a different kind of common strength and a different kind of connection because they get the people that are trying to help. So that, I, I think at the end of the day, people that are broken, you know, they break people. Those that are healed, heal people. And the healing essentially in my mind is unbroken. Man. Powerful. I love that, Anthony. So spot on. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much for being here with me. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. Please check out Anthony on social and text Anthony. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of life coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.